This episode, I'm joined by writer Aaron Sachs to discuss his book, Up From the Depths, Herman Melville, Lewis Mumford and Rediscovery in Dark Times, alongside discussions on industrialization, modernity and more. I'd like to say a big thank you to my paying patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible. And if you'd like to support the podcast, gain access to some exclusive content or just keep everything running as the podcast runs off donations alone, please find links in the description below. Otherwise, please enjoy. So, Aaron Sachs, thanks very much for joining us on Hermetics Podcast. My pleasure. Thanks uh, for having me. So, we are going to be discussing your book, Up From the Depths, uh, Herman Melville, Lewis Mumford, and Rediscovery in Dark Times, which is, uh, these are my own words, uh, somewhat, in a very positive way, encyclopedic dual biography of both Herman Melville and Lewis Mumford, whilst drawing in, uh, of course, Conversations on modernity, on industrialization, on pessimism, on hope, uh, with light sprinklings of theology where it's needed with respect to both the thinkers. And um, this is published by Princeton Press, who I will emphasize didn't, you know, before I say the next thing, didn't send me a free copy because this is uh, obviously I read a lot because this is my job. This is one of the best books I've read this year. So uh, there you go. Um, so Aaron, please tell us how this book came about and why you decided to write it. Sure, thank you. Um, and thank you for those really kind words. Uh, so I, I, honestly, I have about 10 different origin stories for this book, but um, probably the most straightforward one is that I was a big fan of both of these writers, Herman Melville and Lewis Mumford, but in a completely disconnected way. I didn't, I didn't, you know, think of them as having anything to do with each other, really. Mm -hmm. um, and then I discovered that Lewis Mumford had written the second ever biography of Herman Melville. Mm -hmm. uh, and literally this was this was at you know a warehouse where the the friends of the library have their big book sale twice a year and i was just looking in the biography section and i saw this the spine of a book with both of these names on it and i really didn't know what to make of it so um and then that just that got me really really interested in the way that mumford who whom i thought of as this thinker um, who was very, very deep into urban studies and history of technology. Um, what did what did he find so interesting about this novelist from the 19th century who's most famous for a book about whaling? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and I knew, of course, that uh, that Melville had been forgotten for many decades um, and revived only in the 1920s and 30s. And so, you know, I, I started learning about Mumford's role in the Melville revival. And then the, the bigger question for me became like, OK, what does it what does it mean for uh not just one intellectual like Lewis Mumford, but for a culture to to sort of desperately need uh, a writer from the previous century to help them through whatever they're going through um, in the next century. In this case, uh, like I said, the 1920s and 30s. And that that just opened up a whole bunch of questions, as you said, about modernity, industrialization, you know, the, our sense of time and history and, and what role those play in our culture and lives. It's a yeah. It's this this strange atmosphere surrounding Herman Melville. You know, after I read your book, did some more reading, and I sort of started asking questions around this idea of like you almost want to ask people a question like, okay, what did what did Herman Melville write? Okay, Moby Dick. Okay, what else? And then some people might say Bartleby. Some people then say Billy Budd. But if you said okay, outside of those three, what did Herman Melville write? But he is this absolute canonical figure in literature and yet there is this strange non-appreciation of him and then there was this famous revival and as you said it was the second uh biography or overview of melville's work but the first one now is generally understood as it wasn't really very good at all um yeah. so it's all very strange but um one, yeah, just to, I guess to just to crack open everything, as we'll keep this as a fairly free flowing discussion, I have to ask you the Hermetics question. Uh, you can place three thinkers, living or dead, into a room and listen in on the conversation. Who do you pick? And I will emphasize, you don't have to pick Melville and Mumford for this. 
Yeah, thanks. I mean, I, I can't resist picking <laughs> Melville because, you know, the one of the interesting things about this project is that um, they're, the two of them are very, very different in terms of uh, their archive. Um, Mumford is one of the the sort of best documented intellectual figures you could imagine. Um, not only did he publish endlessly, but he kept all of his private writings. And so you can go to uh, the University of Pennsylvania and look through 200 boxes worth of uh, his materials. So I felt like I could get to know him really, really mm-hmm. well. Of course, you know, everybody's mysterious, but mm-hmm. Melville, you know, destroyed almost every scrap of evidence of his inner life. So, you know, it, it's it's much harder. So anyway, I have to choose Melville because I just want to I want to hear him talk. Mm-hmm. Um, and then um, and then I'd also have to choose um, somebody else I've written about who is is perhaps my favorite historical figure ever, uh, Alexander von Humboldt. Mm-hmm. Um who was a scientific explorer from the early 19th century. And it, I would I would say influenced Melville, at least to some extent. Um, and I like the fact that both of them traveled quite a bit uh, and, and could have kind of a global perspective in this conversation. Um, and then I was thinking, you know, I've got two people from the 19th century, um, how about somebody from the 20th century who could who could share some of uh, their global perspective and also bring in uh, more of a female perspective? Mm-hmm. And I thought of Margaret Mead um, just as the the great anthropologist who um, who famously her her first book was Coming of Age in Samoa, and you know. Uh, would obviously share some some interest in uh, in that region with Melville, and could just talk about uh, differences in cultures in the 20th century as modernity really takes over. Mm-hmm. Um, I also just I have to mention um, I became really enamored of Margaret Mead, especially when I listened to this famous recorded conversation or series of conversations really that she had with James Baldwin, the great African American mm-hmm. writer. Um, and they were, I mean, it's, it's, I would highly recommend this to anybody who's uh, interested in, um, in, you know, anything, anything about the 20th century, especially, especially race, of course, but, but they would totally um, call BS on each other. And the way that Margaret Mead did it to James Baldwin was she would say fiddlesticks, <laughs> which is a wonderfully old fashioned um, expression. And and so I was just, I was just imagining her saying that, uh to Melville and, and Humboldt. Anyway, those are those are my three. Sorry for going on. No, no, no. It's good. It's good. What I it's a it's a great room because I'm getting the impression that you're interested in writers. So, you know, the great thing about Mumford is he's talking about urbanism, he's talking about uh, engineering, and I guess in a way in a very abstract sense, he's talking about practicalities. But he himself, you know, cabinet maker, woodworker, engineer, like he knew practical stuff. And in the same same vein, Melville, okay, here's the great Moby Dick. He also was traveling on a ship for many years. And so you're in, So it seems to me that room is about people who can talk in abstraction, but at the same time, they can bring it back to, we've been there and we've done it. And we're not just, you know, there is this element of fairly sincere practicality, but at the same time, extremely expansive. Yeah, no, that's that's a really nice way of putting it. Um, this this combination of groundedness, especially you know in places like the 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 sort of all three of them, I think, have this strong responsibility sense of responsibility to to understand places in and of themselves, and you know, and the people who live there and are connected to those places. But so- then they're always eager to to sort of make comparisons and. Um, you know, like you said, uh, try to talk about more sort of cosmic issues at the same time. So I'm interested, you know, as you said about Mumford, you know, and you, you, you definitely put a lot of this into your book, this extremely personal writer who was, seems to be fairly happy with people knowing about things that you think, why did you let us, why did you let us know that? Like, that isn't something I'd ever want people to know about me if I'd been like that. Right. I mean, clearly, clearly, we could say now a misogynist, clearly not the best husband, you know, somewhat uh, 
almost proud of his affair, I would say. Um, but anyway, that all that aside, I would say, you know, you've clearly put Melville in this room because we don't have much on him. I mean, what do you think Melville would be like in a personal in a personal setting? I mean, um, you know, you, we can gather evidence based on what other people said about him. Um, and given that evidence, some modern commentators have suggested that maybe he was bipolar. Um, it's it's really hard to say, but mm. but I when I was doing this research on him, I I especially noticed, you know, people people. I think you're absolutely right that most people don't actually know Melville anymore, but um, in, in terms of his books, but um, but those who do usually say, even you know, however well they know him, they usually say, well, he's he's a tragic writer. He had a dark vision, um, and so I went into this project with that kind of background, and I was really struck by the people who talked about just how incredibly jovial he could be, like really, really energetic and fun in conversation. Um, and I think, you know, you see that in a book like Moby Dick, even though people don't expect that. And, you know, you, you, you always hear about Moby Dick. Oh, it's so boring. There are all these chapters that just go into detail about whaling. And, you know, I really think of it as a book that where, you know, you sort of feel like you're sitting around a campfire, slowly getting drunk with a really good conversationalist. Um, and so he's just, I, I think he could be really, really fun. Um, at the same time, you know, in certain moods, uh, he he really kind of felt like he had the world on his shoulders and um, and was was sort of plagued by, you know, he, he, he was he was in some ways you could call him a man of faith. He was very interested in religion, um, but not in any doctrinaire way. It might be more accurate to call him a man of doubt, you know, like somebody who really, really struggled with faith and doubt uh, consistently during his life. Um, so, I, I mean, I just think he would be compellingly fascinating, um, whatever whatever mood he uh, he happened to be in in that room. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, this is a, this is a thread that's between both Mumford and Melville. I think this sort of air of tragedy with both of them consistently trying to, and I think that air of tragedy is completely connected with industrialization. For for both of them, there seems to be this um, not necessarily romantic, but a connection to nature or something authentic and sincere, which they both see as being maybe not destroyed, but something is. I don't think I don't think enough has happened in history for either of them actually yet for them to say, look, something's happening with this industrialization, with the rise of modernity, but we must haven't got enough data yet to really say what it is. But it isn't good. But they're both fairly hopeful, like in a very in a tragic way. They're hopeful, if that makes any sense. Oh, absolutely. That's what that's what the book is about. The mm. the book is really ultimately about reckoning with this. Um, not not the sort of universal timeless darkness, although some of that is there, but like what is happening in the Western world? What does what is this modernity that is that is clearly taking over starting in the 19th century and really accelerating in the 20th century? What does it mean? Um, you know, and uh, and let's let's fully grapple with just how sort of destructive a lot of it is um, without saying, well, clearly we should just go back to an earlier time. That was, you know, that the, they, they, you're absolutely right that they, they both were attached to something sort of more authentic about the way life was in, you know, in some ways earlier, but they weren't sort of nostalgic mm -hmm. utopians they both were really interested in um, reckoning with the past and the present in order to sort of gradually construct uh, a more humane future. Um, and, and they found hope, you know, both of them by looking at examples in history of people who had tried to do that, who had persevered through dark times, who had tried to grapple directly with the changes that were happening um, and I ultimately, I find them both really, really helpful, um, and hopeful, 
uh, in part just because they they had this dynamic engagement with history. You know, they're, they're, they they never allow like, one of the um, one of the key aspects of modernity that both of them were interested in is the sense that often in the modern world we wind up feeling disconnected from the past, and mm-hmm. and we're told. You know, there are many voices in Western culture saying, like, that's the great thing about modernity is that we're moving constantly forward. We make these great disjunctive leaps. Um, And both of them are saying, like, that's actually not true. Um, You can always see the past in the present. Um, And and there's something sort of consoling about that, the, the, the past. Um, and our relationship to it, the way that relationship changes, that can give us solid, concrete suggestions for ways of different ways of doing things. Um, it can also just make us feel sort of connected across the generations. There are, there are lots of really, really positive things that come out of, an, you know, taking an active interest in the past. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And one one brilliant way that you you emphasize this i'm not sure if it is your reading of moby dick and the death of ahab well, spoiler alert the death the death of ahab i mean you should have read it by now um or if it was someone else's but the the fact that you know almost like ignorant of what's coming ahab is caught by uh sort of an industrial wire which just wraps wraps around him and then it's described as like the sound of a coming steam train or something like this right and it's like all of a sudden just ripped out of blinded of course the the classic reading blinded by his own sort of vision of this one thing that he has to do just all of a sudden ripped out of the narrative in a way by just this you know what in the world was that that's just arrived and it's industrialization metaphorically speaking and um yeah it seems it seems that both melville and mumford are people who are realizing that that could happen to them and in, in almost in a frantic effort are trying to keep on keep on top of things yeah, um, it's it's really uh, it, it, industrialization is overwhelming, and um, and you know Mumford Mumford feels that in the 1920s, and he has this kind of shock of recognition re- when he reads Melville because he realizes like oh this this this, this is it's, it's not the explosion of industrialization now it was it was happening in the 19th century. Um, and uh, and and there's something really interested and, and complicated about that. But to but to get to dig in a little bit more to what you were saying about industrialization, um, yeah, people when when massive social and economic systems change in that way, people get dragged into them um, with a feeling of you know, just like, well, this is, this is, this is where the world is going. Um, we probably don't have much agency in this. Um, so we better get on board and and sort of figure out how this new system is working. And unfortunately, um, there were from, and I'll, I'll stick with Melville for, for the moment. Mm. Uh, there were two, two sides of this that he saw as really, really dangerous. Um, one was just the sort of alienation that you might experience doing repetitive work, um, whether in a factory or an office. You mentioned Bartleby the Scrivener, right? I mean, like this is the, the Bartleby's problem is that he's just sitting there copying documents over and over again. Um, it's drudgery. It's mm. it's the modern. It's the modern bureaucratic office life. Um, that's one major danger, and and it's it's even worse for some people in factories. Um, it's it's you know, um, and we could we could talk about slavery as well, but <laughs> mm-hmm. we're on industrialization. And then the other danger you could identify with um, Bartleby's employer, um, who is this guy who you know seems to have relatively good intentions he's a he's a lawyer he you know he sees the way the 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 modern world is working he has to employ clerks um right but uh but he's so he, he's he's such, such a system oriented person he's so just sort of enchanted with 
making, you know, making himself successful in this new system that he loses touch with his basic humanity. And he can't, you know, he, he can't recognize that actually this, you know, for him, it's like this, this relationship with Bartleby, my clerk should be purely transactional. I'm paying him. He does the work (laughs) and he, he can't recognize that actually he's destroying the humanity of another person. Mm. Um, And so, um, so Melville see the, sees these these two aspects of uh, what's you know happening in a newly industrializing society, and um, and is really just worried uh, about those two possible reactions uh, to modernity. And then, of course, when you get to Mumford, it's 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 even worse because. It's become so clearly accepted by the Western world. This is that's just the way the world is now. Mm. I think uh, you know one of the one of the common readings of Bartleby Scrivener is that it's you know that that is some allegory of depression. That and I think that's almost like a modern like a sympathetically modern reading that we we kind of wish he was just depressed but actually i don't i don't know i really don't agree with that reading because i think it's um you know the whole i would prefer not to isn't really something a depressed person would say it's it's an acknowledgement of the absurdity right like you said it's it is this to bring in slavery i guess it's like you don't want to say it's slavery but it's like well these are the options and is is this it so it's like you know that sitting down and just eventually just living uh, he just lives there and we don't really know why anymore um and it's interesting to just draw in mumford's own biography in relation to that that mumford himself you know you emphasize that he mentions that he clearly wasn't keen on modernity but he almost as a duty said look i need to go embroil myself within the streets in the he probably would also prefer not to but to understand what he was going to be writing about he sort of submitted himself and said okay let's Let's get in there and see what see what's going on. Sorry, I've thrown a, thrown a lot at you there. No, that, that, that's great. Um, and just to go just to go with the Mumford angle for for right now, um, yeah, I mean he, the he was very very interested in cities. Uh, obviously, another key aspect of modernization was urbanization, um, and uh, and you know I think the. I, I another part of my background is is um, that uh, I'm an environmental historian. So I've dealt in in the past. I've um, I've written about a lot of environmental thinkers, and the great sort of amazing thing about Mumford is that he was totally an environmental thinker. Really embraced ecology as the most important modern science in the early 20th century. Um, early, early adopter of ecology, you could say. Um, and and yet, unlike most other environmental thinkers from that time who just sort of attacked the city as being a, you know, totally um, just sort of a uh, hotbed of environmental destruction, Mumford was saying like, yes, the the city is uh, has taken some bad turns, but you know, what we need to do is make cities better. Cities, cities are also the place where lots of different cultures come together, where people learn how to be public citizens, where they share public space, they form communities. We need cities, but we also need them to be greener and cleaner. Um, And so to me, that, that was just, uh, you know, a, a, a really, it's it, in a nutshell. It, it sort of suggests the possibility of engaging with modernity more constructively. You know, like there were there were a lot of great critics of modernity, and mm-hmm. um, I would include these two as critics of modernity. But but again, something that I wanted to um, to sort of emphasize in their work is that it 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 never just ended with criticism. It mm-hmm. was always okay. What are we going to do to to sort of keep working through this? Um, it's not as simple as progress because both of them were very skeptical about the idea of progress. But it was like, let's you know keep muddling through in as dynamic a way as possible. Um, let's help as many people thrive as possible. 
mm-hmm. uh, especially Mumford. Uh, yeah, it seems for Mumford there was this, 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 you know, the word acceptance, and I don't mean acceptance like submission, but there is like, look, we're going to get, we're going to get cities, we're going to get modernity, we're critical of it. And as you say, there's plenty, you know, take your pick of the critics at the time, but as you say, many are almost like either defeatist or they want to do the whole return thing, which itself is giving into like this linear narrative of backwards is better, forwards is, oh, sorry. Yeah, backwards is better, forwards is worse. And Mumford is, I guess, accepting, look, this is the way things are going. And it almost seems like there was a a lapse of, we just forgot about Mumford and actually now is the Mumfordian time is now, is is now because we're sort of lumped with modernity and we need to use its own tools to begin this sort of ecological restoration. Yeah, um, I, 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 I hope this is uh, a, a Mumfordian moment. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's really, the, the history of technology is really complicated. Um, and and I, I hesitate to, to make any generalizations about it. Um, and, and I certainly don't want to suggest that any given technology is determinative of, of where a society is going. Um, you know, and certainly with something like the climate crisis, you have to look at not just one technology, but but all of industrialization and, and modern history. Um, but I do think that uh, this could be a particularly Mumfordian moment um, in part just because of how deeply the internet and social media have transformed so much of uh, of you know how we think and how we go about our business and our politics. Um, we've got a we've got an election coming up tomorrow in the U.S. and there's been lots and lots written recently in recent days about just you know how much social social media are actually affecting the way that people vote mm-hmm. um, and not determinative uh, i don't i don't ever want to be a technological determinist um but the you know what what mumford would be saying about this is like look just just like with the atomic bomb you know our technology has surpassed our culture the, the, these these sort of these developments um, which in some ways are amazing. Um, they were just adopted without enough forethought or, you know, without enough robust cultural conversation about what these things mean and how we ought to interact with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just too much power in the hands of a technology. Um, and, uh, you know, I, <laughs> I think, um, I think uh, we need that kind of wisdom more than ever uh, right now in this moment. Yeah, that that seems to be Mumford's focus in a way, at least at the beginning of his writings on technology. Now, you have this famous quote by uh, Paul Virilio, you invent the car, you invent the car crash, right? So Mumford's sort of saying this way before he's, you know, he's saying, look, in a way, I guess for Mumford, it's you invent this technology, you invent the history, which that technology is now about to develop, which you just haven't seen coming. You know, he talks about how, well, you invent the firearm, you don't realize you've now invented all defenses of firearms or everything which now, you know, comes about because you've invented firearms and all these very specific little things which he focuses on. And yeah, I, I mean, maybe it's a very open question I'd ask you, but what do you think, Mum? do you think Mumford, if he was teleported into that room that you had at the start and you said look let's go walk around a city now um do you think he do you think he'd feel vindicated or do you think he'd say this has gone this has gone further than i that i thought it would oh yeah i mean depends on the city i guess but um but i think you know uh he was really really good at uh at, at you know not overgeneralizing, right? So, so he would probably see good things and bad things. Um, and uh, in terms of where we are, and you know, it's like I, I an, another origin story for this book is related to climate change. And I think, I think, you know, if Mumford were alive and uh, and 
mentally functional right now, I think that would be his number one issue. Um, and, uh, and it's the sort of thing that forces us, you know, it's like, I, I think one of the mistakes that environmentalists have made over the last several decades, and, and I definitely consider myself an environment, an environmentalist is that they've just been too, or we've been too future oriented. Mm-hmm. Um, we keep talking about the doom that's coming. Um, yeah. and yeah. And Mumford, Mumford would say like, not only is it already here, but like, it's been here for a long time, people, <laughs> you know, like we need to reckon with the, the, all of the sort of pathological trends that got us here. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's, let's focus, uh, you know, not, not on developing the next great technology that might quote unquote, save the world. Let's look at all the stuff that we already have at our disposal that could com- completely transform the energy economy, for instance. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like it could have happened decades ago um, if we'd been thinking in those terms. Uh, so anyway, yeah, I think I think M- Mumford would be appalled in some ways, um, but but still clinging to to hope and 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 eager to to sort of point out all of the potential that is already there that we, that we don't need to figure out sometime in the future, you know, um, it's right here at our fingertips. Mm -hmm. I mean, he he really does stretch back thousands of years when he starts talking about machines and technology. So, you know, they're they're not, they're not coming in full bore as they are in the age of industrial and the industrial revolution, but that mindset, that abstract thing that we call machinization or whatever it is, is definitely there. And I think, you know, as you said, he, he, he wouldn't go to the future because in, in the future, you're just saying you're just, you're just continuing to bolster the mindset, this abstract realm of the machine, which is already here. And, you know, I guess for him, it's about developing a new sort of cultural foundation because we don't seem to be actually changing the actual mindset and cultural foundation. We're just trying to like pile on, pile on solutions. But it's like, yeah, you need to, you need to really get back to the root and and realize yeah it's it's the cultural foundation which it, what he calls cultural preparation we need to like i guess unprepare ourselves yeah absolutely um and this this sort of thing comes up for me um very very frequently in um in sort of conversations with colleagues across disciplines surrounding environmental studies mm-hmm. um like I, like I mentioned, I I think of myself largely as an environmental historian, and um, and that has led me to to various kinds of interdisciplinary initiatives um, at my university and other places where you know the thinking is well you know to to solve something like the climate crisis, we we need the technicians, we need the scientists. We also need the social sciences. We need the humanities. We need all of these different perspectives. But some some of the scientists don't don't get that. With all with all due respect to the scientists, you know, so I've I've been sitting across from environmental scientists who just kind of look at me and and literally say, "We don't. I don't understand what a historian can offer this." You know, we're we're looking for practical technical solutions right now, um, and you know the. The short version of what I say to them very politely is like, well, you know, we've actually had a lot of solutions for a long time. What we haven't had is the mindsets to implement them or the political will to implement them. So let's let's look at how we can change mindsets and political will. And um, history has some suggestions about that. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, I mean, I I I think. Mumford Mumford came to that realization a long, long time ago that, you know, the, the technology is going to keep changing. You know, human beings are really good at innovating. It's it's you know, it's wonderful to, to see that. Um, but technologies don't have any value inherently you know like the, the, they're not tech, no, no technology is is automatically good or bad it's it's all about what meaning we make from that technology how we use it how we think about it mm-hmm. um 
And again, you know, you can see this also with something like artificial intelligence today, mm-hmm. right? I and mean, we just we just need a much more robust conversation about what these technologies uh, mean and um, and you know, like how we ought to relate to them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I guess this brings us back to that question of progress, because I mean, Jack Alul, who's sort of highly inspired, influenced by Mumford, he says they were entering into uh, just a means, you know, you have ends and means, and he says it's just means means for the sake of means, right? So technology is like, well, technology for the sake of more technology. And this is something that Mumford emphasizes. And I guess this is also in Melville's work of that, where, where, where exactly are we going? You keep sort of promoting this industrialization or this technology, but but for what for what purpose? It's sort of like science. Science comes in with the solutions, but it's like okay, solutions for what end? And I guess maybe the, so far this all seems quite tragic. Um, where where would you say that end, that hope, is found? You know, within the the dialogue that's happening within your book. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I I think in a lot of different places, you know, it's it, we could we could go to many different examples, I think, but, um, but, you know, maybe a good starting point is just Moby Dick since a lot of people are familiar with it. Um, And one of, you know, Mumford was obsessed with, with all things Melville for his entire life. And, and so, you know, he had different interpretations of Moby Dick at different times of his life, uh, interestingly, but probably the most important gloss uh, of Moby Dick for Mumford was like, this, this book is not a tragedy. Um, even though everybody except Ishmael is killed um, because specifically because there is somebody left to tell the tale. Um, so ultimately it's, you know, the, the whole book is about the effort to make meaning from even things that, come across as tragic you know it's in a way it's it's like Mumford was saying um that that Melville was saying look there 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 are going to be monomaniacal captains there are going to be malignant whales um there this is the way the world is but what do you make of that what are you going to do with that um how are you going to go on and um, and in fact, like I said before, the the actual sort of feeling that you get when you're reading Moby Dick is is this feeling of incredible energy. Mm-hmm. You know, like Ishmael is Ishmael is really fascinated by what he has lived through, and um, and he's trying to make meaning of it, even though you know he himself is uh, is famous for claiming that he doesn't he doesn't really you know he's he's, he's not going to give you any definitive explanation of any of this um this is the the whole story is going to feel incomplete but that's appropriate that what that means is the effort just has to continue um you need to keep talking about these things so i i find that very very hopeful Mm -hmm. um there's a kind of dialogue that that uh, an implied dialogue that that creates um with you know bet- between past and present and future um and i th- i think mumford really held on to that in, in a very positive way um it's never about plot with melville you know it's like you know there is a great plot in moby dick you're great the, there's this ship full of people going after uh the white whale um but so i'll I'll mention one other uh piece of writing by melville that almost nobody has read uh, which is called clarol um it was published in 1876 and um it's a poem in two volumes right (laughs) it's it's some people think of it as actually the longest poem in the english language Uh, and melville himself said that it was um, eminently adapted for unpopularity. <laughs> it's very hard to read, um, but it's but it's amazing. Um, it's another story that is on the surface incredibly tragic. It's about this um, this figure uh, whose name is Clarel, uh, an American who goes to the Holy Land, the Middle East, um, on a kind of pilgrimage and just wanders through the desert and. Um, 
you know, falls, falls in love with somebody, um, and, uh, and, and then that person dies. Spoiler alert again. <laughs> anyway, it's, it's it's basically the story of somebody just endlessly wrestling with doubt and um, and so tragic on the surface but again there's this incredible energy in the wrestling you know it's like this 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 kind of will to persevere and and sort of work through um all of these uh these issues that you know on the surface could be seen as just completely overwhelming. Um, and again, I, f- I find a great deal of hopefulness in that, you know, the, um, the sense that we, we have all of this interesting history. Um, we have faced all of these really, really difficult challenges before um, all the stuff that we're going through Nowadays, in the 21st century, you know, a a lot of people say that it's unprecedented and it certainly feels new to many of us because, you know, like we're we have limited capacity for for remembering things. Um, But both Melville and Mumford would say, like, this this is part of what it means to be human. And more specifically, this is part of what it means to be a modern human and um, and the 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 reckoning the very act of reckoning with that um is hopeful in and of itself you know the 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 sort of move that you make to to sort of step back and say you know past present future these are all interconnected they're all swirling together and it's our job to the, to sort of engage with that so do you see melville and mumford themselves almost as self-knowing Ishmael characters. So they, they know, so, you know, all these other characters have that, like Ahab clearly has his thing that he wants to do. And if, if the plot was focused around him, it probably would be a disappointing novel. But yeah. in the sense that self-knowing Ishmael, in the sense they know that if they plant their flag and try like, yeah, I know, strictly prove something, you're just going to be eaten alive by industrialization and modernity. So you just have to become this almost... You have to try draw your morality because it's it, oddly, you know, we've been speaking about this, all, all these things so far, and it's it's almost like comes across as quite uh, like amoral, not am- immoral, but amoral. Like where's where's how to be good in all of this, and to to draw your morality just from okay, I'm just gonna be a like a passenger and see what's going on, and then try my best, but instead of like the Ahab, <laughs> the Ahab stance. I don't know if you'd agree with that. Yeah, I mean, I, the, I'm really glad that you mentioned Ishmael again because um, you know every, a lot of people know uh, Ishmael as the main character of Moby Dick, the famous first line, "Call me Ishmael." Um, that figure of Ishmael, who is the sort of classic outcast in the Bible, the person who feels that everyone's hand is against him, that character comes up again and again in Melville's other books. Um, it's a it's a very very common sort of comparison that he makes to, in, in a sense, the modern condition. Um, you could you know like some some more psycho psychoanalytic critics um, you know have have sort of suggested that that figure comes up a lot for Melville just because that was Melville's personality. Melville felt like an outcast, felt like nobody appreciated him, that sort of thing. And that's, that's a legitimate um, piece of analysis, but I think it's much broader than that. I think it's Melville's awareness that that's part of the modern condition um, that many people wind up feeling alienated that, you know, to use Karl Marx's term, but um but, you know, Melville was constantly playing with this interesting dialectic, and Mumford was fascinated with this too, between the psychological and the social. They're, you know, they're, they're never independent. They're like, who, whoever you are psychologically is partly determined by, mm-hmm. you know, your role in society and vice versa. Um, so anyway, yeah, there's this, this, um, this sense that uh, it's part of the modern condition to, to feel alienated, to feel like an outcast. Okay, what do you do with that? <laughs> um, 
And uh, and Melville's answer over and over again, and it's I, I, it's essentially the same as Mumford's answer is you try to make meaning out of it, you know, like uh, you try to sort of think about what your relationships are, why they're like that, um, and and I guess the 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 next step that that Mumford takes a little bit more explicitly than Melville is you try to create communities of meaning Mm -hmm. um you know some of the some some of the best work that that mumford did surrounding cities was was really about trying to build new forms of community that were viable in an urban context Um, and you know that 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 often meant just sort of bringing things down to a smaller scale 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 is a, a a big problem in cities right um but uh, but Mumford was really interested in the possibilities of uh, you know having lots of smaller interconnected communities within the one big body of a city, mm. and then trying to connect cities as well. But that yeah, that's another thing. But um, but anyway, yeah. So so um, so what what can Ishmael do? Uh, make meaning, make community. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I guess it's a great mistake though, conflation in a way that all this technology that's come forward, all these huge cities, the the longer you look at them, you realize just because they're big and they're all interconnected and all, all there's this sort of massive, amazing technology doesn't mean, impl- of course, we, we're only just starting to understand this, I guess, is it doesn't bring any meaning with it. There's no meaning inherent in a new technology. And I think we often make the mistake of like, well, there was no meaning in the iPhone 11, so we'll make the iPhone 12 and, and ho- <laughs> hope that that one has meaning in it. Or we'll put, we'll put a third camera on and then that will like somehow imbue it with uh, you know that will solve the existential crisis, um, but it's it's extremely difficult. I guess the the longer we, the you know the longer it goes on that we just keep trying to do this, the further and further we move away from what we can consider to be that authentic, real foundation which is needed for anything to grow at all. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the there there are many. I was talking about scale just a second ago, and there there are many different scales um, we could discuss this at. And, and Mumford tries um, to cover all of those different scales, going from the global down to the personal and individual. Um, but especially as he grew older, um, and I feel like this is uh, this is true of me as well, um, right? He wanted to he wanted to bring it back down to mindsets and personal relationships you know like like you were saying like we, the 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 sort of baseline culture the foundation that we need uh to deal with all of these inevitable traumas and challenges um and i i guess i would just say so i i think of this sometimes in terms of my teaching right mm-hmm. the um the university in general society in general is imposing more and more technology on things like teaching just Mm -hmm. just this semester at my university um they started this new program where basically you know like instead of allowing professors to order books that their students could read um all the readings essentially have to be electronic unless unless they're not available electronically um Mm. so um so that what that means is that more and more often students are going to be sitting in classrooms with devices Mm -hmm. i i used to be able to for many years i used to be able to say like sorry no electronic devices are allowed in my classroom Mm. um and now the university is making it so i can't say that anymore Mm -hmm. But the, you know, the thing that I'm going to keep saying to my students and the thing that I said when I was explaining my no devices policy is like, look, all this stuff that we're studying, all of this history and literature that we're talking about, that's that's important. But probably the most important thing about being uh, in a classroom together is just being in a classroom Mm -hmm. together. 
just being completely present with each other, looking at each other in the eye, taking each other seriously, you know, thinking thoughts together and, and, and modeling what it's like to, to be in a real community where you might have disagreements. You probably should have disagreements, um, but you can do it civilly and uh, with respect um, and with the real possibility of changing each other's minds. Mm -hmm. Um, That's like, to me, that that's why I teach. That's what's most important to me. Um, And, and I think that's part of what, Mumford was saying when when his when his writings sort of became more and more personal and spiritual, um, just to give one concrete example. Right. I mean, he he was absolutely furious with um, the the United States lack of interest in fascism in Europe in the late 1930s. You know, like basically he was he was watching what was happening in Germany and saying like we need to mm-hmm. like now 1938 1939 um nobody was interested you know virtually virtually no intellectuals or politicians in the united states was interested in getting involved they were scarred from world war 1 they just like they want they were like this is a european issue it's not a big deal it's going to mm-hmm. be fine um and he was saying like no <laughs> uh we need to intervene and um, and the first book that he wrote to, to sort of express that was um, was a very, very angry book that was that was meant to sort of get the attention of politicians. Um, and then a year later, he wrote a book um, about the same topic, essentially. But it was it was more like, listen, this is this is for the individual person um, to think about how. Uh, how you should live ethically and responsibly in the modern world. Mm -hmm. Um, And that book, which is one of his most incredible ones is called faith for living. Um, Which is, I tried to get a copy of this. It's like disappeared off the map. Yeah. It's, it's out of print. Um, You know, it's very hard to find, uh, but totally worth it. If, you know, like I I would, I would hope um, at least, the occasional university library would still have it, but um, but anyway, yeah. I mean, the the that sense that there is work people can do on a very personal, individual level, community level. It's not the only thing, right? I mean, we we still have to we still have to have marches in the streets. We still have to have you know our politicians um, being held accountable. Um, so there, there are many different scales uh, at, at which we have to act, but um, but there is something important about just saying that some of some of what we need to do is is at that mindset level. Mm-hmm. That would be an interesting movement, and uh, try and try sign up restaurants or cafes to no electronic devices allowed inside. The impossible, <laughs> the impossibility of letting the machine in. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's just, it, it, it I, all, all of us living in the Western world, I think are keenly aware of how life has changed because of these devices. Um, we've all, we've all been sitting there in a restaurant with, uh, you know, on a date or with our, uh, with a spouse or with a kid um, and wanting to engage with them and find that they're on the device. <laughs> um, and the device is more important than, than your presence. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's one of those things we still haven't caught up to. We're still, we're still navigating. So what should, what should we have faith in then? Um, <laughs> Uh, well, what I've, uh, what I've been falling back on a lot lately is comedy, <laughs> um, because, uh, it, it, it actually helps to, to gain some purchase on really dire situations. If you just are able to step back and laugh for a minute, um, what do we have faith in ultimately? Uh, I, I, I don't know, mm-hmm. uh, but 
you know, the, for me, and this is again, part of, part of my identity as, um, as a humanities scholar and teacher, um, is just that, you know, there, there's always this potential in human beings, in individuals, in communities, um, to change and uh, and to adapt and uh, and to rethink to change our minds, um, and so you know, like I, I ultimately I, ha- I have faith in a kind of dialogue, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, and to me, you know, some of the most significant and and renewing dialogue uh revitalizing dialogue is with figures from the past and obviously i'm biased i'm a historian but um but you know there's I, i've i've talked to a lot of people especially a lot of students about this and a lot of people have said to me it's just it's incredibly bolstering to recognize that this stuff we're going through is not unprecedented mm-hmm. this you know th- this is about a long process of modernization um and people have been grappling with it for a long time in different ways some of them had great ideas some of them it's just inspiring that they survived it you know that they got through it and um and had something to say about it um so yeah um that's my best shot at faith Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I would have been surprised if you'd had a, a completely, you know, strict answer. Exactly this thing. Um, yeah, I mean, is there anything you'd like to add about your your book that you feel we haven't touched on? I mean, one, yeah, one thing I want to emphasize is that this book really does manage to draw in a mass of elements. So go into it with a with an open mind in a way, because it's not, you know, it's not specifically a history of industrialization in relation to Melville and Mumford. It is this, uh, it, you know, it, it uh, tells that that history and that tragedy in relation to the biographies of both. So it's done in a very, um, yeah, very unique way. I mean, is there, but is there anything you'd like to, to add? Well, thanks. I really appreciate that. I, I mean, it, it, to me, it was very important to try to tell a human story, right? So the, um, those, those societal scales of modernity and industrialization are certainly important to me, but I thought it could be useful to, to actually see that developing through these two strangely interlinked individuals. Um, and so I guess one other thing I would say about the book that's, that's a little bit weird, but I, but I hope productive for readers is that the chapters are fairly short and they alternate between the two characters. So there's, um, it, it, it's a bit head spinning chronologically because um, because you're going back and forth between the 20th century and the 19th century. Mm-hmm. Um, but what the point? What's odd about that is each each time you flip between the two, there is clear connections, like very obviously clear connections to the point of it's, it's sort of sort of uncanny. And as you were saying, also like it's this almost. Um, historically empirical proof of nothing new under the sun but in a good way of in like as in the both these people are having the same i've had the same dialogue and are really trying to push the same thing um yeah thank you that's exactly (laughs) that's exactly what i was going for so i'm glad it worked for you Mm -hmm, (laughs) mm -hmm. where would you where would you advise people to begin with with either either thinker um i mean you can't go wrong with Moby dick but if you don't have time for that um melville was absolutely brilliant at short stories um he had a career a a point in his career in the 1850s where he was really focused on um writing for periodicals which you know was made made him more money than his uh than his novels um so he has a a collection of story called the piazza tales for instance which is uh which is amazing um and with Mumford, um, I, I think, uh, you know, I think you mentioned your, your reading Technics and Civilization. I think his two greatest books, aside from the, the Melville biography, which is fantastic, but, um, Technics and Civilization from 1934 and then his follow up to that, The Culture of Cities from 1938, um, I think are really his, uh, masterworks. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would, generally point people in that direction. I'm fairly sure the Melville uh, biography is also out of print, right? Yes. Oh, yes. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I guess guess of Mumford's work, that's probably the last 
the the last one that they're going to go into reprint. Um, so where about whereabouts can we find your book? So this is Princeton. So I'm assuming Princeton Publishers website and also Amazon and all these these sorts of places, yeah. of course. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, what are you what are you working on now? Well, I mentioned comedy. I've been I've been really sort of digging into the the history and theory of comedy, especially in relation to climate change. Um, I just I think there are these great traditions of of kind of gallows humor, um, uh, and I wound up especially researching um, the Jewish tradition and the African American tradition. Mm-hmm both peoples who have dealt with a lot of suffering and oppression and used comedy to, to sort of um, get some purchase on that, uh, which is, I think, you know, something we could do with climate change. So, uh, so I actually have a, a book, a very, very short book coming out about that next year. Um, which, which, it, com- which comedians are you, are you drawing on any modern comedians or is it more, cause I know in the Jewish tradition is, Specifically, I mean, there's a long history of like, there's been a, you know, there's been a catastrophe sort of thing. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, 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 lots and lots of modern comedians, um, you know, from, from both of those uh, traditions, Jewish and African American, but also lots of women sort of feminist comedians, um, yeah, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a fairly wide ranging work, although, um, one quarter the length of of this book it's a much it's a it's meant to be a very sort of quick pick me up sort of read <laughs> honestly like you know it's it's uh it's a work of research but but you know the my, my my hope really is that it will cheer people up a little bit um to to help them cope with climate change and and be better climate activists ultimately <laughs> that sounds like a good, a good yeah that sounds like a good book after years and years of uh constant collapse books and you know yeah all the books are about despair <laughs> yeah and what is to be done or if there's anything to be done or we've made a mistake or blah 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 yeah mm. well i look forward to seeing that book um and yeah i'll be sure to put the links for this book in the description below um yeah i mean is there, is there anything you'd like to add before we finish up no, I'm just, I'm really grateful. Thanks so much for your interest. And it was a, it was great talking to you. Yeah, it was a great conversation. Aaron Sachs, thank you very much.